بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ویلکم ٹو پارٹ تھری ان وچ وی ول ڈسکس دی ٹریٹمنٹ آف جوینائل میزو فرنجیل اینجیو فائبروما دا لنکس فار پارٹ ون اینڈ پارٹ ٹو ویڈیوز آر دیئر ان دی ڈسکرپشن ایٹیو پیتھوجینسز کلینیکل پریزنٹیشن انویسٹیگیشنز اینڈ ڈائگنوسز یو کین چیک اٹ آؤٹ there so as far as treatment for juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma is concerned it will depend upon the tumor location and its extent then its vascular supply and if preoperative embolization has been done its effectiveness facial skeletal maturity and of course the availability of expertise but the treatment of choice is surgery surgery can be endoscopic or it can be open or there may be a combination of these techniques Hippocrates removed a hard nasal polyp through midline nose splitting incision and later it was found to be juvenile angiofibroma. Then Liston performed another. So this is a brief history. He went through a Weber Ferguson incision. Of course there was no anesthesia at that time and histopathological examination showed it a fibrovascular nature. So Diagnosis is dependent upon clinical picture and radiological evidence. Biopsy is contraindicated in a suspected case of nasopharyngeal angiofibroma, preoperative embolization, and then treatment is that surgical excision is the treatment of choice for nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. And as far as surgery is concerned, there are different approaches. And these approaches we have to decide for a particular patient depending upon the staging of the tumor in that particular case. Accordingly, we will decide these approaches. These include transpalatine approach. There can be then transpalatine plus sublabial approach, extended lateral rhinotomy, mid-facial degloving, maxillary swing, but last but not the least, endoscopic approach. because nowadays this is an era of endoscopic surgery. Everyone has got the scars. So surgery is the gold standard. Radiation therapy is reserved for unresectable in part two when we were doing the staging of the disease we found that from stage 1 to stage 4a surgery is applicable only very few cases which will be under the staging of stage 4b where we can think about this radiotherapy chemotherapy again it can be used for those patients who have undergone with previous surgery and radiation hormone therapy Later on, I will discuss about this hormone therapy in detail, but theoretically, it looks plausible that estrogens and anti-androgens, they can decrease the tumor size and vascularity. Preoperative embolization, different groups have different uh, opinions uh, for smaller tumors or if the uh, feeding vessels, they are terminal uh, branches of the internal maxillary. then there is no need for uh, embolization, preoperative embolization. But for extensive lesions that get blood supply from branches of the internal carotid or external carotid, then it is necessary. For medium-sized tumors, the benefits of preoperative embolization are doubtful. Uh, but still, in intraoperative blood loss is less when preoperative embolization has been done. The maxillary artery, are the carotid, external carotid artery 
these can be controlled or ligated relatively easily at an early stage in any open procedure regardless of whether embolization has been undertaken or not. Then with preoperative embolization, it was thought that recurrence rate should be reduced, but on contrary, it was found to be increased. And the reason being maybe that the tumor shrinkage makes its borders ill-defined. Otherwise, grossly, if we see the tumor has got a very well, well demarcated borders which makes its excision easy but due to embolization there may be shrinkage of the tumor and borders may be ill defined especially in the bottom of deep bloody operative field it leads to inadequate resection and ultimately recurrence rate is increased or it is high but if preoperative embolization is decided, it should be done within 24 to 72 hours preoperatively. Gel foam or polyvinyl alcohol foam is used. Gel foam is usually resorbed in approximately two weeks. And efficacy is so much that even in stage one tumor excision, without embolization, the blood loss, expected blood loss is around 840 ml while with embolization it was reduced to 275 milliliter. Here you can see a leash of blood vessels and after embolization you can see how much blood supply is decreased. Similarly here how much vascular tumor it is before embolization and after embolization the blood supply so much less. Some people have tried preoperative chemotherapy also like estrogen, it causes the shrinkage but it delays the surgery and unwanted secondary feminizing effects in an adolescent male. So its usage was limited ultimately. Then flutamide was used for shrinkage of the tumor. This is a non-steroidal androgen receptor blocker. Usually it is used in the treatment of prostatic cancer with side effects like nausea, breast tenderness and gynecomastia which are reversible after the stoppage of the medication. So it seems that this drug might have a role in the preoperative preparation of the patients with very advanced tumors especially when there is intracranial extension. But in another study they found that only 77.5% of the cases they have some shrinkage so its usage was not considered significant. Now surgical resection as I just mentioned endoscopic sinus surgery is at the top and then there are other approaches depending upon the site and size and extension and staging of the tumor we will decide the uh, which approach we have to go for. Then if tumor is too much extensive or stage is too much advanced then we can go even for a combination of these approaches more than one combination rather a triple approach in very extensive tumor like transpalatal plus lateral anatomy plus cadaver lux can be combined for the resection of the tumor but at the end of the day the treatment of choice is surgical excision so these are different approaches and different incisions through which we can go for example this lateral anatomy or even it can be extended to where uh, Weber Ferguson incision, then mandibular swing can be used, infratemporal fossa approach, then mid facial degloving, and by opening the mouth, transpalatal approach for the early stage tumors. Endoscopic endonasal techniques. Now, for undergraduates, the details of this it is not required. For undergraduates, this is sufficient that you must mention that the treatment of choice is surgery and uh, in early stage tumors, we can go for endonasal surgeries or endoscopic sinus surgeries and in advanced tumors, we have to decide which surgical approach we can uh, choose for that particular patient. This endoscopic for postgraduates, of course, it is necessary to know the details, indications and contraindications for each surgical approach. So very quickly, I will go through a few approaches, most common as I said endoscopic endonasal surgeries which is uh, in vogue now 
so fish classification according to that type 1 and type 2 and some type 3 tumors which are still limited to the medial invasion of the infratemporal fossa they are done through this technique large tumors and those extending across or through the skull base intracranially they have gone they are difficult to remove through this technique and we have to opt for some other surgical technique for those tumors of course through endoscopic approach less uh, blood loss complication rate is less hospital stay is less recurrence rate is negligible so we have to go after local infiltration of the anesthesia we should you know dissect uh, this resect the anterior end of the middle turbinate and then we should go for anterior ethmoidectomy together with removal of the medial wall of the maxillary sinus and then access to the posterior wall of the antrum is gained and this wall is then removed to reach the complete lateral exposure of the tumor and then the tumor is dissected and bipolar thyatherm is used like a clips can be used In open approaches, as I told you, the choice will depend upon the extent of the tumor. So, the tumor which is at stage 1 or stage 2, we can go for transpalatal approach. And this is the CT scan which will show us the extent of the tumor. In transpalatal, we go for, after applying the mouth gag, we go for inverted U-shaped incision which is extending up to the hard palate from one maxillary tubercle to another maxillary tubercle as you can see the line of incision here and this is bipedical flap posteriorly based bipedical the mucoperiosteal flap of the palate it is elevated and with the use of an osteotome or a high speed drill with a burr the posterior margin of the hard palate is excised to gain the access to the tumor and then tumor is resected this is the tumor lateral margins of the tumor has been resected and it is delivered in the operation field still more resection and then it is removed and that defect is being sutured in the palate this is the mass which is being removed you can see dumbbell shaped this is a central narrow stack which is there at the sphenopalatine foramen then this is the post operative care we will just skip it over then mid facial degloving approach of course it will be applied if the tumor is very extensive and it has gone in the infratemporal fossa or it has gone into the cheek then we have to go far it is a bilateral extended transnasal maxillary approach. Anterior, middle, medial and posterior walls of the maxillary antrum can be removed so that a large cavity is there which is confluent with the nasal cavity and post nasal space and whole tumor is in front which can be removed easily and there is no visible scarring so cosmetically it is more visible. So this is the starting incision here sublabially so sublabially you give the incision and soft tissues are being you know lifted up along with that there is a incision in the intercartilaginous incision in the nose on both sides so that all soft tissues with gingivo buccal incisions they are being raised and then like this all Sub soft tissues they are raised from the face and the maxilla is exposed so anterior wall medial wall posterior wall can be removed and whole of the tumor is there in the visual field it can easily be removed and still there will be no uh, uh, external scarring on the face this is how the effect will be there Then medial maxillectomy approach can be used which is applicable for the inverted papilloma as well for that we have to go for 
lateral rhinotomy uh, incision. So it will depend upon the extent of the tumor, especially if it has gone behind the maxilla and it has come into the cheek, then we have to go for this one after embolization by carotid angiography. So this is, will be the incision which we will give. It is, a, you can say, a modified Weber-Ferguson incision. Or you can go a formal Weber-Ferguson incision depending upon the extent of the tumor. So you can modify the approach according to the staging of the tumor in a particular patient. So this is how detractors are being applied. Maxilla, interior wall you can remove and then you can go exactly over the tumor. So removing, we're doing the medial maxillotomy. The tumor has been excised. So these are the detailed operative steps. You can check it out from operative surgery books. More appropriately, when the surgery is being done, you can understand all these. My objective is just to give you an overall idea of that what is feasible and available for us. We have to tailor the surgery according to the need of that particular patient. So this is how stitches are applied after removal of the tumor. And this is the huge mass which has been excised in this particular patient. Of course, this huge mass cannot be approached through transpalatal or through endoscopic approach. This was removed from the sphenoid sinus, from nasopharynx, from nasal cavity and left maxillary antrum. So much extended tumor it was. And this is a healed scar. For this lateral anatomy or Weber Ferguson or Lynch incisions after three months of surgery. And this is post operative endoscopic view of the nasopharynx, total removal of the tumor with normal clear quina and a well epithelized mucosal surface. Then Danker's approach that is, Danker's approach is a combination of transpalatal and transantral approach. That can be used that uh, medially through transpalatal approach you can remove the tumor and its lateral extension can be approached through transantral route. Now the radiotherapy is I told you it is reserved for extensive intracranial extension and recurrent tumors only that is uh, you can say a stage 4b tumors which are very rare. And it has been used as a primary mode of treatment, a dose of 3000 to 3500 centigrade in 15 to 18 fractions is delivered in three weeks. Tumor regresses slowly in about a year. Sometimes it may take up to three years. Similarly, chemotherapy for recurrent and residual lesions have been treated by chemotherapy. Doxorubicin, vincristin and decarbazine in combination has been used. So external beam radiation, it was delivered in several fractions. There will be reduction in size of the tumor, but still residual tumor will be there. It does not completely remove the tumor. So local control rates, you can say 80 to 85 percent have been achieved. But treatment failure is quite accept expected because the residual tumor is there. So later on, within first two to three years, a surgical salvage surgery was generally successful. There are no reports on the efficacy of gamma knife therapy as yet. So some patients may have been treated by some means in some centers. So hormonal therapy, as I just mentioned, that theoretically uh, it is looks uh, sounds quite plausible. So estrogen, progesterone and androgen receptors, they are found in the juvenile nasoangiofibroma. 
but some juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibromas they lack these receptors but the use of these hormones they delay the surgery then feminizing side effects are there and cardiovascular complications are there so that's why they are no more used but practically you can say then efficacy of the treatment with flutamide i just mentioned before also there is no statistically significant difference in size so no tumor shrinkage is there and no difference in the blood loss as well so there is no advantage with this treatment so complications recurrence is the main complication if it is not properly excised there will be recurrence up to 25 to 50 percent of the recurrence rate has been reported then there can be depending upon that which surgery and which surgical procedure or an approach is being used there can be infraorbital nerve problems there can be prolonged nasal crusting leading to ozina that is atrophy of the nose later on and if then the patient may be having ocular problems like ophthalmoplegia or displacement of the globe then late complications especially if radiotherapy is also used there can be growth retardation radiation keratopathy there can be temporal lobe necrosis cataracts and some second neoplasms have developed in radiation field also even at a later date so it is a very rare tumor but still the most common benign tumor of the nasopharynx it is a benign but clinically we can say it is intermediate type of tumor was very highly vascular tumor exclusively in teenage males surgery is the treatment of choice and uh, from endoscopic to you know widespread approaches are available depending upon uh, the stage of the tumor we have to choose it and a frequent follow up after treatment is necessary because recurrence rate is very high in this tumor so thank you very much for watching if you find it uh, beneficial for you please share it with your friends thanks again